Welcome. It's great to have you with us at Central Church Online this week. Psalm 111 says this, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. May we be people today and this week who give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts for all of his great works to us. My name is Oliver. I'm a student minister here at Central Church, and it's my privilege to be leading us in worship today. It's Mother's Day, so let me say a, a special welcome to all of the mums. My wife and I welcomed our first child, a daughter, last year, and so I've had a lot of, lot of opportunities over that time to see the sacrifice and the work that my wife has, has put into caring for our daughter. And so let me say a special Happy Mother's Day to all the mums. This is the third week of our series in the book of Colossians. The series is called More Than Enough. We live at a time when we're always being encouraged to look for something new, something better, always waiting for something better around the corner. It might be a new TV, a better car, nicer clothes. We're always used to having a, a, the opportunity to move on to something better. In our passage today, we'll see God's encouragement and his challenge to us to not think about our faith that way, to not think about that, uh, the gospel and Jesus that way. We don't move on. We're to hold steady. We're to, to be firm in our faith because there isn't anything better. Jesus is more than enough. First, though, we'll spend some time praying together and appropriately this week we'll be spending some time praying for mothers. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, our story begins in Genesis in creation. Your first commandment to Eve was to be fruitful and multiply, that is to be a mum. We acknowledge today that motherhood is a calling that comes first from you and so we pray that you would give us strength to honour you in the way we as a community mother our children. For those mums amongst us who are, who are changing nappies, who are cutting food into tiny pieces, who are dealing with meltdowns and refused naps, when the days feel long and the nights feel longer, remind them that you see them, that they are honouring you with their work, that you love them and that in the stillness of the night they are not alone. For those who are mothering older children, who are pushing boundaries, finding their voice and testing parents' tempers, ground our mums first in your love and help them to navigate discipline with grace. For those mothering teens through big emotions and the trickiness that comes with growing into an adult, when passionate conversations turn to slam doors, when words are thrown like knives and acts of love are met with contempt, hold them, Father, and remind them that you also hold their teens and give them courage, and please give them courage to keep pursuing and parenting them uh, in the light of the gospel. Help them to celebrate and encourage each small evidence of grace in their lives as our teens develop their own relationship with you. Refresh all our mums by your spirit, Lord, and awaken their hearts to the goodness of you in the gift of their children. Remind them of how you knitted together each of these precious children in their womb, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made in the very image of God. Give mums joy each day as they see you at work in them and their children. Help them to cherish special moments and rejoice in your grace. Keep them prayerful that their children, grandchildren, and spiritual children would grow in the knowledge of God's will and increase in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Help them to combat the enemy who would rather distract with the frustrations of interruptions, scrolling of social media feeds, and the urgency of daily tasks, and instead help them to stop and watch them dance to be silly, to learn new skills, or to delight in your creation and turn to marvel at their maker. Help them as they feel the ache of the love that they have for their babies, children, and teens, and remind them that it's a mere shadow of the love that you bestow on us in Christ. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, start now to look at our, our Bible passage for today, uh, it's worth knowing that there's a, a talk outline. If you wanted to follow this link, you'll be able to find that there. Uh, follow along with us. The reading, though, is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. I'll give you a moment to find it if you've got a Bible of your own. Uh, it'd be really helpful to open it up and, and follow along with me. 
so that we can read together. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray and, and dive into our passage. Now, Father in heaven, please be at work today in us by your spirit to enable us to, to hear clearly and well what the gospel is in, that who, uh, in who Jesus is, um, so that we might all the more hold firm, trusting in him as our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, Will Ferrell has a movie about a race car driver named Ricky Bobby. It's a Will Ferrell movie, so it's a comedy, it's ridiculous, but it has an interesting moment in it. There's a scene where Ricky Bobby sits down for dinner with his family and he says grace by praying to Lord Baby Jesus. Obviously it's a joke, but I think we kind of need to laugh at ourselves because I think that we can all be a bit like Ricky Bobby. I mean, we can have an immature picture of Jesus, a small picture of who Jesus is. And that's a problem. It's, it's a problem because if in your mind Jesus is small, it means the challenges in your, you have in life can seem bigger. If Jesus is small, then the world fighting against the gospel seems like it's going to win. If you think Jesus is small, how can you trust him? How can you have faith in him? Well, like an archer lining up his arrow, in our passage today, God takes aim at that part of us. He takes aim at the little Ricky Bobby inside each of us that has too small, too weak a view of Jesus. Instead, Paul gives us such an amazing vision of just who Jesus is that it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for years. Jesus is still greater than you realize. And that means that we can be confident that he can protect us until the end. And so we need to hold on to Jesus. We need to be firm in the gospel until the end. So that brings us to our first big idea. Don't minimize Jesus. He's more important. Starting at verse 15, Paul begins by telling us that Jesus is the very image of God. God is not made of atoms and flesh and blood like we are. God isn't part of creation. He isn't made of flesh and blood that we can see or touch. Yet Jesus is the unique and perfect way that God has stepped into his own creation by taking on a human nature like ours. And that means Jesus is greater than anyone or anything in creation. He's more important, more powerful. And that's where Paul goes. He continues on by describing Jesus as the firstborn of all creation. Now, that might sound a little odd to you. It's Mother's Day, so we've got mums and bubs on our mind. So doesn't firstborn mean that Jesus is God's first kid? Or maybe that Jesus was part of everything that God has made, a special first creature? No, it doesn't mean that. Remember, Paul's just called Jesus the image of God, God himself stepped into his creation. Plus, as we'll see in a bit, in the next few verses, Paul's really clear that everything that was made was made by Jesus. And that means that Jesus can't be one of those things that were made. It'd be like seeing this painting, a picture of an artist's hand holding a paintbrush, and then have someone try to, to say to you that the painting must have painted itself. The hand in the painting painted the painting. But no, Jesus isn't part of creation. He made creation in the same way that 
the painter isn't part of the painting. They made the painting. Make sense? He's not part of the painting. So what then does Jesus mean by calling Jesus? Uh, what does Paul mean by calling Jesus the firstborn? The answer is that Paul means firstborn in an older sense of the word. Jesus is the firstborn because everything belongs to him. Thinking about Mother's Day again, one part of the magic of loving your kids is that you just want to, to give them everything that you possibly can, everything that you have. I can now finally relate enough to say that that works out pretty well because I'm pretty sure my daughter will take everything that I have to give her and then some on top of that. One aspect of that is that your kids inherit everything that you have. Now when that happens, we're, we're used to kids all sharing an inheritance equally. But you see, that's not actually how things have always been done. In, in Paul's day, the firstborn was special. He'd get the lion's share of the inheritance. He has the greatest status and privilege and, and all of that. And you see, it's that idea of privilege and blessing and status that Paul has in mind in our passage when he says that Jesus is the firstborn. You can see that really clearly in verse 16. At the end there, Paul sums it up by saying that everything was created for Jesus. It's all for Jesus. He is the firstborn. He owns everything. So firstborn is pointing to Jesus' special glory, his special status. Here then, it's actually worth pausing a little bit on that idea that, that Jesus is the firstborn, that everything is for him. You see, it means that our lives are ultimately lived for him. Does that describe how you think about your life? I don't know if you're the kind of person to have a 10-year plan or a 5-year plan, or maybe just a 5-minute plan, but as you're making decisions in life, as you make choices about what job to take, about where to live, how to spend your time, how to spend your money, do you have in mind the question, am I ultimately serving Jesus' purposes or my purposes? You see, if that's not part of your thinking, it needs to be. because. Everything, including you, including your family, your neighborhood, our country, our planet, our solar system and beyond, every part of that creation is created to serve and glorify Jesus. And that means that your life's purpose is to live for Jesus, not for yourself. So we live differently. We live counterculturally. Now that might look like loving your family and friends in a, in a self-sacrificial way beyond what's comfortable or, or convenient. It might mean working well, working honestly, even when we won't be recognized for it or, or nobody notices. It might mean turning down that promotion because it would mean that you couldn't be there for your family as much or couldn't serve at church anymore or, or read the Bible with a workmate. You'll have chances, you will, in, in every part of your life to ask, is this ultimately serving Jesus, advancing the gospel, loving people like he wants, helping people to know him? Or is it about me? So one way we can minimize Jesus is by treating him as just a supporting friend who helps us fulfill our goals in our life, rather than saying, no, as God is telling us here, we live our lives for Jesus, to serve Jesus, because He's the firstborn. He's more important. He's more important. Let's jump now to our, our second point. Jesus is more powerful. Don't worry, we will get out of the first verse. Paul says in verse 16 that everything was made by Jesus. And that means that he's more powerful than anything that we might be afraid of, anything that we might worry about. And Paul gives us a list then to help capture the, the scope that he has in mind. You see, we have these, these binaries to show that he really means everything. He says it's the stuff in heaven and the stuff on earth. It's the stuff you can see and the stuff you can't see. It's, it's everything. And then he goes on to mention thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, all these different powers that are at work in the world. Things like political leaders, countries, powerful business people spiritual forces as well who are at work against God. All of these were made by Jesus. And that matters a lot because 
You see, it, people in, in Paul's day were deeply worried about all these kinds of things, deeply worried about, um, about who they needed to be appeasing, who they needed to be serving, about who was going to wreck their life. Maybe you're worried about that too. You see, we may not think about it as much, but it's really important, it's really valuable to be able to see the example of, of the audience that Paul's writing to, to see the Colossians and their worries and how Paul's addressing them. Uh, they were worried about all these kinds of powers. They were worried about trying to appease the God that they thought made them healthy or sick. I mean, they were worried about the kinds of rituals that they needed so that the God of farming would make their crops grow. They had a real anxiety and an uncertainty about life. And despite all the differences, I know that that's not something we're exempt to. That's, that's something that we experience just as much. But do you see then Paul's solution to that? How Paul is helping us to see the answer is in Jesus. Jesus made everything, and so it means that he's above all of it. And that means that if you belong to Jesus, you don't need to worry about any of it. We don't need to worry about fate. We don't need to worry about bad luck. We don't need to worry about demonic forces because Jesus is greater, bigger. Jesus is more powerful than all of them. And we belong to him. If you've trusted in Jesus for salvation, God has placed us into Jesus' kingdom. That was what we saw last week. And that means that we can be comforted by Jesus' rule. We can trust what Jesus gives us. I don't know if you've heard this joke before, uh, to say that someone isn't superstitious. They're just a little stitious. As pragmatic as we Aussies can be, without Jesus in the equation, we're actually still trapped in those kinds of worries and anxieties about life. We may not worry about how to appease the, the Greek god of wealth, but we definitely worry about the great uncontrollable unknown that is the stock market. You probably don't worry about appeasing the god of farming, but you might be worried about where the next meal is coming from. It's easy to worry about what China is doing this week, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in America. We can be worried about what the global elites are doing behind closed doors. And yet in the face of all those potential worries, we can be secure in knowing that Jesus is more powerful than them all. Whatever problems that we worry about, we can be comforted that Jesus is greater. He's more powerful. And we see Jesus' power all the more in verse 17. Paul says that Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That means that even today, Jesus is still holding everything together. He's still keeping the universe spinning, as you might say. And, and that's valuable for us to see, because I reckon we tend to fall into, well, we tend to fall into the trap of thinking that the world is this entirely independent thing which exists and, and carries on happily, no intervention needed. Maybe we think it's like a, a wind-up clock that God made and, and then put down over here to, to leave us alone. That God made us and left us off to the side to do our thing. But that's not right. No, a better picture would be like a plane going uh, to Sydney. Imagine someone in the middle of this flight that you're on going to Sydney thought that they're in the air, takeoff has happened, therefore they don't need the plane anymore and they want to get off. But you see, do you see the absurdity of that? The plane gets you off the ground, but it isn't just that. It's what keeps you in the air. And Paul is saying that Jesus is a little bit like that in making everything. He made everything at the start, but more than that, he holds everything together today. He keeps us in the air, alive, sustained. Every moment of every day, every, every moment of every week, every moment of every year of our lives, we depend entirely on God to even take our next breath. That's what it is to be human, to be a creature. That's, 
that's part of, of, do you see, why our rejection of God can be so absurd. How can we possibly seek to cut ourselves off from the one who is our source of life? How can that result in anything but death? But you see, that's us when we think that we don't need God. That's us when we think we can live without him. When we want to say, just leave me alone, God. Let me live my own life. So don't do that. Don't fall into that trap. Don't minimize Jesus because he made everything and he's holding it all together. So he's more powerful than anything that we might be worried about. Let's, let's jump now to our third section. Don't minimize Jesus. He brings peace. Paul moves on in the passage to say that we shouldn't minimize Jesus because he's the one who rescues us. In verse 18, Paul says that Jesus is the head of the body, the head of the church. The metaphor of a head and, and a body usually means something like origin, where something started, or authority, who's in charge. And here I reckon that Paul actually means both. Jesus is the beginning of the church, and he has the firstborn privilege and status. And you can see that all the more in what follows. Jesus is the beginning of the church because he was the first person to rise with the new body that we'll all have in the new creation in heaven. It's like saying he's the first car to roll off the factory line. And that's no accident. That's part of God's intentional plan. Paul says that it is so that in everything, in all things, Jesus might be, he says, preeminent might be special privileged. Jesus was first because it makes sure that in every way, Jesus gets the glory and status that he deserves. Paul gives us two extra reasons why Jesus deserves that kind of status, that kind of privilege. I mean, it's worth saying, and it is fair to say here, that we're just piling on to what's already pretty obvious from the first part of our passage today, that, that Jesus, of course, deserves that kind of status because he's the one who made us everything. But Paul gives us actually two more reasons why Jesus deserves to be first. The first of them is that Jesus is God himself. Verse 19 says, for in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That means that Jesus is every bit of God. There's, there's nothing left out. Jesus isn't just a little bit like God. He isn't half of God, a third of God. He's fully God who's taken on a human nature, a human body just like ours, and stepped into his creation. And because he's God, of course he deserves to be preeminent to be special in his creation. He's the one who made us. We owe him everything. Paul goes further though, as if that wasn't enough to give us a second reason. He says that it's through, uh, it is uh, through Jesus that God has brought peace to the world and reconciled it all to himself through the cross. Paul unpacks that in the next two verses. And there are two parts to it. Two parts. The first is that we needed to be saved, to be reconciled to God. The second is that God's done that for us through Jesus and his death. Through Jesus and his death. So firstly, we need to be reconciled to God. Uh, notice how we're described apart from Christ in verses, uh, verse 21. Paul says that we were hostile to God. He says we're, we're alienated from him and ultimately from each other as well. I mean, that was true right back in the beginning. If you don't know the story, after Adam and Eve reject God's rule in the garden, they were exiled from the garden, exiled, rejected from God's presence. But not only are they, are they alienated then from God, they become alienated from each other. You see, in the beginning they were, they were naked and without shame, but as soon as they eat the fruit, they feel shame. They seek to, to cover themselves with fig leaves. They no longer have the perfect harmony of, of a relationship, a marriage, without sin in the picture. They've been alienated from each other. And that's part of our heritage, from them as, as our parents. You see, we've been born into a world where we're alienated from God and, 
and alienated from each other. But it's not just a case of estrangement, like when you, you don't know how to speak to the, the old relative at the Christmas party, things just seem a bit awkward. It's actually worse than that. You see, Paul says, we're also hostile, doing evil deeds. I'm sure at some point in your life you felt that alienation from a friend, or maybe a family member, when it feels like you're on the opposite sides of a war and nothing you do can repair that relationship. Now, as hard as those moments can be in life, remember the bigger problem that it points to, that it's just a reflection of the larger broken relationship that we have with God without Jesus. We were alienated from God, hostile to him, alienated from each other, and so we desperately then need God to bring us reconciliation, to bring us peace. Which is why it's so amazing that God has brought us peace through Jesus. You see, Christ came to heal the broken relationships that we have with God and with other people. And he's done it through Jesus and his death on the cross. You see, it's the cross that lies at the heart of God's plans of salvation. It's the cross which lies at the heart of his working to bring peace in the world. It's through the cross that Jesus makes us holy and blameless with a spotless record, able to stand again before our God. And in that, there's a challenge. There's a challenge to anyone who wants to say that there are many ways to God, many ways to make peace with God. Because you see, the Bible only gives us one. It's through Jesus himself and his atoning death. Now, I know that sometimes it can seem challenging to say that Jesus is the only way. It can seem easier, nicer even. It can seem, seem more loving to say that the God has made it possible to come to him through all kinds of ways. But there's actually a critical error in that thinking. You see, it's, it's the Ricky Bobby inside of us coming out with his, his small view of, of who Jesus is. You see, because of who Jesus is, it's actually good. It's right that it is through Jesus and Jesus alone that God has brought peace because of who Jesus is. You see, he's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. He's the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. How can there possibly be any other way of salvation? For us to look for life, for, to look for, for salvation anywhere but in Jesus is to say, no thanks God. Jesus isn't good enough, valuable enough. Jesus isn't important enough. I don't need him. Do you see how that dishonors God. It dishonors Christ. And that's why, even though on the surface it can seem nicer to be able to say that there are many ways to God, if we actually try to find salvation anywhere else, it's to spit in Jesus' face, to say that what he's done isn't good enough, to say that what he's done isn't sufficient, it's not valuable enough for us, and it undercuts the glory that he deserves. So don't minimize Jesus, because in him and him alone, we find peace. Our last point, hold on to Jesus. How, how do we respond to this amazing picture of Jesus, which Paul has given us? Have a look at then at our, our last verse, verse 23. The short answer is that we need to hold on to Jesus, hold on to the gospel of Christ, all that we've seen about Jesus that he's the first one, that he's made everything, that he, he brings peace. All of that means we need to hold on to Jesus, hold steadfast to the gospel of Jesus, because he's the only one that you can go to. He's the only one you can go to. And that's a big point. You see, as we go through the letter to the Colossians, it seems like the Colossians were being pressured to question whether the gospel they heard was actually true, or to question that the gospel was enough. Maybe they were being pressured to even give in to changes to the gospel, to people adding stuff to the message to say it's not just about faith in Jesus, it's about faith in Jesus plus you need to do this and that and, and whatever it may be. It's, it's speculation but I wonder if maybe they were being told that Jesus was only part of the solution, that they actually needed to move beyond the basics about Jesus to then 
uh, more advanced, more special rituals or, or powers or ideas in order to keep growing. To that, Paul says, no, Jesus is everything that God has to give you. Jesus is enough. Jesus is greater than everything else. So there is, there is nothing which anyone or anything can possibly add to what we have in Christ. There's no one else we need to turn to. There's no work that we need to try and uh, do in, in order to reconcile ourselves to God. God's already done it in Jesus. He is everything that we need. And so stand firm in the truth. Stand firm in the gospel that you were taught when someone first opened up the Bible with you. Because for Christians, there is no extra secrets or rituals or, or levels or ideas. Uh, nothing that gets added to what you've learnt already in the gospel. Uh, don't get me wrong here. We do grow. We deepen in our knowledge and love of God, in our character, in our wisdom. We bear fruit in our lives as we know God more and more. We saw that last week. But it's a growth that's all about a deepening of what you were taught in the beginning, of faith in Christ for life and forgiveness. And so we need to hold on to Jesus, our glorious Savior, the image of God, the firstborn over all creation, because he's, he's reconciled us to God by his death. There's no one else to turn to. There's nothing else on offer. So don't be led astray. Don't be tempted to add anything to the gospel you've been taught. Don't minimize Jesus. Instead, see what Paul's showing us here. Jesus' glory and power and majesty and hold on to him, stable and steadfast. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we can only thank and praise you for sending us your only Son, your very image, to bring us peace and reconcile us to yourself through his death on the cross. Enable us by your Holy Spirit to see Jesus more and more clearly, and so to continue to hold firm to him and him alone. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Have a great week this week. Um, living as God's people in a world that needs God's love. Let's finish by saying, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.